let's uh, start with the second panel now. And what art should you buy and for your life in the metaverse? And uh, I welcome Philippe Cotier, who is going to be the moderator. He's chairman of L1, uh, L1 Digital. We have Hugo McDonald, he's CEO of MyNFT. Then we have Sergio Mottola, president of Public Pressure. And by the way, the Public Pressure is the one that brought the DJ for us later on. And last but not least, we have R Rutger van Zuiden, CEO of Odyssey. And uh, anybody wants to speak Dutch with him, we can start after to do that. <laughs> Please welcome. Under the peak. Welcome everyone to this panel on NFTs and the metaverse. My name is Philippe Cotier. I'm the uh, co-founder of L1 Digital. L1 Digital is an asset manager based in Zurich. We uh, are fully focused on blockchain and digital assets. We're regulated by FINMA and we run about $500 million of assets on the management. I am also a proud investor in Sightail Horizon. Thanks, Mark and Christoph. Um, I'm very excited to be here. So let's start. The, there's a lot of people that think that mass user adoption in cryptos has finally started. Mass user adoption in the form or in the creative space in the form of NFTs around art, collectibles, music, gaming, metaverse, social tokens, etc., etc. So this is an extremely hot space. It's a very interesting, fascinating space, very fast moving. And I'm extremely happy and excited to have on this panel three very high profile speakers, Hugo, Sergio and Rutger. So thanks for being here today. Let's start right away. So if, if you could present yourselves, introduce yourselves quickly and spend max two minutes explaining your project to um, non-blockchain experts. Cool. Um, well, I'll start. Uh, so I'm Hugo. I'm co-founder and uh, CEO of a company in the UK called Perpetual Altruism. We have three products under the company. Um, we started with one called Cryptograph back in sort of 2017. The idea was to build these uh, you know, one of one NFTs that would create a perpetual philanthropic legacy for creators. So these assets that were made by sort of famous icons and artists would be sold and they can't be destroyed. And as they're resold, they generate revenue for a charity of their choice and for the creator as well. Um, out of that, we learned a lot of early, uh, entered a lot of problems with, with Ethereum in many ways when it came to gas price inflation, when it came to UX, many other potential issues. And that led to uh, 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 the creation of my NFT that we'll be launching in June, um, the first version of, which is really the big idea there is a, is a, is a, is a marketplace for any NFT on any blockchain uh, uh, that can be bought and sold in any currency. Um, and then there's a third part to the business, which is called GBM which is a price discovery system that we invented um, again back in sort of 2017, 2018. Um, it'll be a core part of the MyNFT uh, uh, product as well. And we licensed that, that, that technology out. The concept is it's a, essentially a bid to earn auction. So it's a price discovery system that uses smart contracts and digital money. And um, the concept is, and the way that it works is you either make money in the auction or you win the asset. They're the only two outcomes. Uh, this leads to very interesting price discovery and um, leads to some very interesting uh, behavioral mechanics in, in the market. So those are the three things that the company does. And um, uh, uh, my NFT will be out in a, in a couple of months where you'll be able to see all the work we've been busily doing uh, uh, um, under closed doors. Yep. My turn. Hello, everyone. My name is Sergio. From my accent, you understand I'm Italian, even though I, I grew up in London where I spent 22 years, but I kept the origin very, very strict. Uh, been in innovation for 15 years, almost. Uh, I think that few people in the room know me uh, for the work I've done in regulation. Uh, back in the days in the Republic of San Marino, I got close to crypto and blockchain. Uh, I mean, understanding how to help, working for a government and understanding how to help uh, uh, from a regulatory perspective, the ecosystem uh, to grow. 
And that's where I built uh, pretty much all the network, all the people I know in blockchain. Uh, then in 2020, obviously, I mean, after COVID, uh, I left my post. Uh, and, and I mean, I started really knocking on the door of a lot of people and say, what can we do? Let's do a project. No? Let's build a project. What can be the next idea? I had the pleasure to, to, to somehow uh, share this uh, share this, uh, this vision for crypto and web free with a couple of friends uh, which are sitting here in the room, Giulia Maresca and Francesca Versace. I think the good idea, maybe an applause for the fact that we have two women coming from the fashion side joining, in, joining the crypto world. It's been, a, it's been, a, it's been a, a super achievement. And what we actually got together, very simple, that's why I tell you this story because the pitch of the company is super simple. We do music in web free. So what we do is uh, basically bring in the music industry, artists, let them understand what it means, uh, you know, the future of internet. Web3 is not going to be about streaming. Web3 is about going back and own the music. So we're going to buy music. The format under which music is going to be sold, I mean, for where the current circumstances are, is NFTs. So what we are doing on a daily basis is uh, dealing with art and understanding how we can create exceptional uh, NFT campaign with music and also al other collaboration like with fashion brand, visual artists, photography, musicians, and that's the vision of public pressure. Right. Hi everyone, <coughs> uh, Rutger van Zuidam from the Netherlands. Um, Odyssey is a Dutch uh, nonprofit foundation building momentum. And <coughs> momentum enables anyone to uh, enter the metaverse uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is that uh, the metaverse is kind of a, a venue, so to say, a space. And uh, this space uh, yeah, would be, is valuable now because there's lots of people and there's activity going on. So the reason why we ended up in the, in the metaverse is because we were organizing the biggest hackathon in Europe. 3,000 people were about to come to the north of the Netherlands, but of course, due to COVID, that couldn't happen. So we know already that there were no suitable platforms to do real collaboration and, and hackathons in, in, a, in a massive scale. So that's why we've created a 3D world to do that uh, in an epic environment that is fully catered to uh, co-creation and building together and achieving uh, uh, yeah, valuable outcomes. That leads us to, let's say, supporting digital societies in creating and building together. This together, um, think of this, what emerges is a decentralized um, open source metaverse network where everyone can build 3D worlds that are all interconnected and um, yeah, that form kind of a new type of multilateral social network that host uh, a, a multitude of, of activities in which you can participate. And those digital societies can bring their own econo econo uh, economics, their own governance, their own community. And uh, yeah, as we always say, uh, people uh, uh, come uh, and they join for the uh, activities. They come back for the people and they stay because it's their online home together uh, from which they together can grow. So that's what we are doing. Great, thanks. Um, would it be fair to call you guys Mr. Marketplace, Mr. Music, and Mr. Metaverse? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Uh, Happy good. with that. Yeah. We can survive. So, so you're running your vertical in this great new space, Web3, decentralized world. What are the dynamics in your spaces? Like, is it, is it winner take all? You have to grow as fast as you can to occupy the whole space? Or is there enough space for lots of different winners and, and it would be very dynamic going forward? How, how does it actually look like? Um, maybe uh, starting the other way around with you, Rutger, yeah. working this way. Well, <coughs> if, if we look at the metaverse, I would say the, the metaverse equals the internet. So there is not, there is not one uh, who takes it all, like Meta or Decentraland or the Sandbox. There are many different visions on the metaverse and on digital societies. So uh, some emulate the physical world, whereas we uh, say, okay, your imagination, is, your imagination is a starting point. So we don't have land or you're not walking in a physical space. You don't build buildings. Uh, we would like to meet on the rings of Saturn. Um, so so I, I, there is a, there's gaming, 
spaces in the metaverse. There's non-gaming spaces with all kinds of uh, different purposes. So I, I, I think it's just like websites, right? These 3D worlds. Um, if you have a website, an app, you have your social media accounts, and within five years, every everyone has presence in the metaverse with a 3D world or in someone else's 3D world. So. It's a good question. Actually, I think that what we want, uh, I mean, the beginning of this process has to be about the quality of what you do. So you cannot really be too concerned uh, about taking over the market, grow as crazy. That's what we repeat inside uh, in team meetings every day. You know, we, we, we taking the responsibility to go to an industry that somehow it's very new to NFTs, it's very new to dropping music into a web free format. I mean, something maybe a couple of months uh, ago, three months ago, no? we started with, with, with this sort of trends. So we have the responsibility to sit down, ask the right question, develop the right strategy, and do the right things. <coughs> Otherwise, it will be just about speculation. And then works as well for the community. I think one of the most important elements on any project in crypto is the community that is creating around the value proposition. And NFTs, they are about, they are about value creation. That's what they expect today. Maybe we're going to get in three years. Uh, this is one of the critical questions that, that, that we discuss uh, all the time. You know, because music, generally, you want a, a massive distribution. You're looking for, for penetrating as much people as possible around the world. That's what is streaming about. And somehow we are still in a moment where we're designing uh, limited edition, we are designing collection, we are designing something which has got to have value. Because currently the user then take that NFT and maybe go and collateralize the NFT in a decentralized platform. He, he, he used that value that is being created for doing other stuff. So I'm not sure we can really rush at this stage. And then the other point, uh, I always think of blockchains uh, as a sort of, I don't know, maybe a country, a place where, where, where you have a group of people which are aligned with the vision, with the strategy, with the society, with the community they want to build. And uh, as long as you don't go crazy in competition in there, somehow I think there are space for everyone to keep on collaborating and building together. That maybe cross-chain, conquering, Whatever is outside uh, our ecosystem, it will be it will be the next stage. But now, yeah, and I just add to that that at the heart of what an NFT is is it's a it's a different it's a new kind of deed. It's a it's a blank sheet of paper that you can write value into. You can change, you can add rights to it. it you can you can you know it's a canvas that you can do a lot with, and it's programmable, and it is therefore an extremely powerful tool, and it's instantly more liquid than many of the things that we use today to verify and, and uh, um, prove ownership. And so with that, I'm of the belief that one day every non-fungible asset that you see in the world will be represented by a token because fundamentally I think it's better. It's more verifiable, it's more liquid, it's uh, uh, more programmable. And I think that that is an inevitability, really, because once you've invented something better, it usually it usually uh, 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 gets gets takes hold over time. And because of that, I think the market is therefore so insanely vast that I don't think, especially the days we're in right now, that we're in a, a, a stage where it's you know a winner takes all scenario, or someone has to go find that bit of land and, and and carve out that bit of territory. I think at this stage, most of us are all just trying to build infrastructure that will allow that bigger blue sky to to appear. Um, and then also, I think, which is also part and parcel of why we, we chose Polkadot as a, as a base layer to be on top of, is interoperability is going to be crucial to this whole evolution. I think that people are going to want to move their assets and their goods freely between worlds, blockchain worlds, between ecosystems, and their uh, ability to do that in a way uh, um, effectively has been created by the architecture of Polkadot. And so for us being a sort of marketplace and being a place where we want to create liquidity for everybody's assets, for any NFT, we want to be in the place where we think over time that's going to naturally kind of aggregate. So, um, and people can move in and out of these systems. So that's, I, th I think the winner takes all scenario here is almost sort of slightly antithetical to the idea of uh, a, a, an open source, uh, a, a wider world of value that can be created on top of all of this technology. 
So I was, I was just going to ask about uh, Polkadot and Kusama. If I'm not mistaken, all of you are actually building on Kusama and Polkadot, right? Why, why is that? Why did you decide to do so? And do you have any plans to go multi-chain in the future? Or is there no need for that? Whoever wants yeah, to take yeah. the question. Can you go for it? Yeah, we're, <coughs> we're definitely uh, building on uh, first Kusama and then uh, probably later uh, uh, Polkadot. And what is so uh, great for us, uh, we want to bring utility to the metaverse. So all the utility that is brought by the specific parachains, we can kind of integrate in, uh, in a composable way um, into the world builder we're creating. Yeah? So whether you want to place a 3D asset in a, in a space and uh, attach an NFT to it or um, uh, uh, make it part of uh, a social, uh, sorry, a, a smart contract, uh, bring staking in. Um, so it's a mixture of online and on-chain activities. So for us, the, the, the ecosystem is perfect. Um, also, this, this is uh, an ecosystem that uh, has a collaborative nature. So uh, it is very inviting to collaborate with the other parachains to build value together, and then you have a multiplier effect. So that is what I've, I don't see in other ecosystems. And that also draws in a certain type of people that are extremely collaborative. So if you, if you go to, to Polkadot or Dotsama events, um, yeah, uh, y you're bound to make uh, good business and, and if you have something to offer, uh, and, and then you can build partnerships uh, very well. And so uh, in, in that regard, it's much more about out collaborating uh, as an ecosystem than, than uh, yeah, competing. So that fits us very well. Yeah, I think I, I, I would definitely agree on, on the ecosystem characteristics. I think the people and collaboration has been the main driver to, to join. Actually, I think it was a natural process for us. No? At some point, we, we really started designing the value proposition, the business model. We started from the adoption. That's how public pressure was born. So the founders getting together, the founders going to the industry practitioners, so music expert, uh, CEOs of labels. Uh, I mean, does this one make sense? Can we, can we build a value proposition? Would you come on board? Or would you help us out? And only when we had the certainty, we said, okay, now let's try to find the best place where, where we can <coughs> grow and strive. And I always raise my hand and I say, we're not a technological project. You know? We're just looking for technology partner, which are going to but deliver, because we need to be focused in the adoption. We need to be focused on the product. We need to be focused in you know, moving and transferring music industry in, in Web3. And we had conversation with a lot of other ecosystems. But then when we started engage, I mean, we, we spoke. I, I, I spoke with both guys I, I, when I met Mark and Shai Tail. Suddenly, this conversation became so natural that, that, that we said we, we're not going to be able to build in any other place. I mean, we met Bruno Remark, we started to understand about composable NFTs, and I said, wow, I mean, here we have composable NFTs. I mean, there is another level in Kuzam of innovation and cooperation and engagement compared to any other conversation that we have out there. That one was mm. perfect. And then the branding and actually the people are actually really cool. So we said that that's our home. Yeah, I think for us, I mean, because as a team, my team has been, we've been in the space for quite a while. And when we launched our first project on Ethereum, we encountered, as I sort of said before, a lot of, a lot of teething issues, scalability being one. And we sat down and we had a good look at all the different places, and all the different protocols that were being built. And um, from our analysis, our decision was that Polkadot was solving the, the blockchain trilemma best, right? You know, scalability, security, and decentralization, and the cost benefits, but the trade-offs between all of these things. And architecturally, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, and the, the, the idea of a natively sharded chain, the relay chain, sharing scalability, sharing bandwidth, how parachains can talk to each other, th it was quite m mind blowing to us, actually. And we, we, having seen that, we were then like, well, we're an Ethereum based project initially our code is in solidity and all the uh, and their infrastructure is there the moonbeam parachain which was one of the first uh, uh, to get their slot allows c uh, companies and and projects like us to be able to quite easily port into the wider polka dot ecosystem and kusama ecosystem and so that's why we took the decision to to be placed on that tech stack because fundamentally we believe in a multi-chain world we need secure scalable decentralized uh, 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 foundations to build upon, and Polkadot has 
most definitely produce that. So that's why we, we chose it. Let's go a little bit deeper here. So um, how, how does your you guys' business model actually work? So how do you make money and who are your biggest customers? But, but <laughs> try to keep it short and simple. Sh sure. Um, in our case, across the, 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 the three projects, the first is GBM, which is uh, a piece of technology that we integrate and license out and, 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 and um, to, to other companies. At the moment, NFT projects and um, other Web3-based uh, companies because that's you need that architecture for it to work very well, and we take 2% on all of the winning bids that go through that system. Um, the marketplace is a transactional-based business. We take 2% of all the things that go through it. And then Cryptograph, which is a slightly different um, uh, 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 kettle of fish, which is, you know, sort of a, it's a s less scalable, more kind of curated production arm for philanthropically based uh, NFTs. So we only take a small um, uh, piece of sort of 5 to 10% of the revenue share on each of those assets that we produce along with the creator and the charity. Uh, and the idea was to incentivize everybody around um, uh, uh, adding value to these things over the long term to, to generate more impact was the, was the concept. Yeah. Yeah, we, we operate very similarly because we are, I mean, partly an e-commerce when, when we have a curation and a particular relationship with the artist and part the marketplace. So obviously there is a drop which has been sold, NFT has been sold, and we take a, a cut and a fee uh, on top of the total revenue of uh, the drop. Uh, we do a lot of consultant strategic work with the music industry, which uh, we don't charge on principle, we really said we don't want to get into consulting. For us, this one is an investment to make sure that all the know-how is going to be transferred to who is going to ultimately use the platform without our intervention, because the vision is that the fees are going to decrease the more we can decentralize and, and, and automate uh, the use of the platform. And then we have a secondary market where somehow the same principle is every time a token uh, an NFT change of ownership, uh, you can apply either a royalty free, a royalty fee at the beginning because when you mint uh, the, the, the collection, the artist is capable to program uh, into the NFT, uh, for example, a five, six percent perpetual. I mean, that's how we call it. It's not really perpetual for, for regulation fee coming back all the time to the artist, and then we take a small percentage as a marketplace. But somehow we're trying to reverse how the industry works. In the traditional industry, 20% to the artist, 80% to the supply chain, and we're trying to reverse the maximum gain and maximum revenues to, to the artistic content and the producer, and then very little in the supply chain. Yeah. So <coughs> uh, with the world builder, anyone will be able to build their own world for free. When you want to enable social networking, you become part of the network. That's when you mint your world as an NFT then you enable people to stake their tokens uh, in that world. Ba basically, you, you become a stakeholder in that world. And then, from then on, you can build connections with people, with activities, etc. And uh, the network gives you staking rewards for that. The worlds can, uh, can, can ask a commission. So the worlds can, can make money. And uh, yeah, when, the, when the staking rewards are paid, uh, the network uh, uh, yeah, charges a fee. What are your biggest challenges? Short vision. Talent. PSD2. Talent. Yeah, talent. It's, uh, <laughs> developers, uh, especially in Rust. Yeah, yeah I'd say, um, yeah, ta talent is a big one. And then also, um, yeah, figuring out, figuring out how you, you wade through the, the mire of um, existing legacy infrastructure when it comes to kind of redefining ownership. I'd say that's a pretty big challenge. Um, yeah. Currently for us is regulation, I have to yeah. say, because we, we force ourselves to live in both worlds. So, I mean, whatever is crypto is perfect, can be done effectively, compliance, PSD2. You go back into the fiat world, you want to sell NFTs with fiat payment, you want to be available all over the world, and you get into every sort <coughs> of Nimer payments, banking Nimers. It's incredible. I spend most of that time, my time trying to figure out legislative bypass and, 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 and ways to get done what I would have done than, than maybe looking at technology. That is the biggest hurdle, I would say. 
So, so we talked mostly about the verticals, let's call them verticals, uh, marketplace, music, metaverse. Um, there's a lot more in the NFT space. There's gaming, there's social tokens, there's, I mean, tokenized IP, there's, it's endless, like art and collectibles and whatnot. Um, which, which verticals do you see uh, catching on traction the fastest? Where, where do you see real mass user adoption happening first? Anyone? I think that um, one of the key unique selling points of, a, of an NFT is liquidity. And so markets that struggle for liquidity, bad supply and demand, bad information asymmetry between the buyers and the sellers, middlemen that are too big, let's say, these are the kinds of markets, especially the intangible asset ones, uh, tickets, for example, access rights, these kinds of things, I think are going to be uh, 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 the first to really be disrupted, let's say. And, um, you know, in our, in our case specifically, one of the first sort of other verticals that we're we'll going to be bringing into the more sort of liquid realm of NFTs that we're trying to do with my NFT is, is Web2 domain names. So it's, a, it's in many ways the original NFT. It's, a, it's a, uh, an asset that um, has a lot of people that buy and sell them. There, there's a lot of speculators in the market, but there's a lot of... Uh, heavy lifting that you have to do between transferring these things. There are 60-day transfer periods. There's a lot of friction. There's a lot of issues like that. So if you had a way to deposit this asset and a, rem a good remission process, and in the middle a tokenized infrastructure, which is what we'll be providing, you'll be able to buy and sell these assets much faster at a global scale in any currency with some interesting price discovery systems that have only been created thanks to this kind of technology. So that's just a small example, but an example of where an intangible asset market that is looking for more liquidity with an NFT layer in it will immediately be given. And so I think that it's going to be uh, one that's going to uh, be disrupted fairly fast. Yeah, we look at the creator economy. <coughs> so you say everything that has to be used in the metaverse has to be built. And everything that is consumed has to be created. And, and whether it is art, uh, policy, uh, software, research, education, um, uh, what you see with all the, the Web2 platforms, uh, when the creators are in, uh, the mainstream uh, gets in as well. And so uh, if we look at the, the growth in, in Web3, uh, projections are a billion users before 2025. <coughs> so I say again, a billion users before 2025. So, so and that, that leaves us at, at the internet in about 98 at the moment. But in 98, the internet was growing with 63%. And so, so we look at uh, the, the big spectrum of the creator economy in the broadest uh, sense to, to cater. Yeah. Sergio, are you going to be conflicted? But it's obviously music, I mean, because, because, because we're biased. But maybe, but maybe I'll, I'll tell you why, so you understand uh, the intellectual process that we, we've been going through. Uh, I mean, musicians, uh, I mean, I, I, I discovered by, by, by talking to them that it's almost like a life mission. No? People that are doing music are going to do music for the rest of their life. You have people which are doing music, which are doing different jobs uh, to support themselves. So what we figured out is that there was a sort of very emotional friction there. So if we are able to bring a business model and a solution to let them support themselves and survive and gain money and earn, with a technological solution that goes back to a product, that goes back to your community, that let you engage uh, your super fan. Uh, I mean, that is going to be one of the strongest communities that is going to drop Web2 and is going to move in Web3. That, that, that's what we figured out emotionally. That's why we believe it's going to work. Thanks. So before I ask my last question to the panel, um, Sasha mentioned that we might have time for one or two questions. So if you could prepare the microphones or your questions, if you have any. <laughs> you should be fully proficient on NFTs by now, after 20 minutes, obviously. Um, and after that, th the last thing we will do is, is uh, run a little uh, demo by Rutger um, after the uh, question from the audience. So my last question is the grand vision. What's your grand vision for your space? What's your space going to look like in five years? Short answer, please. Um, five years... I don't know for sure, but it'll 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 definitely be growing long, long term. As I said before, any non fungible asset in the world that you see today, whether it's a fixed income instrument, whether it's a piece of real estate, whether it's a piece of intellectual property, will have a token representing its value one day, and um, that's how I think it's going to evolve. 
I mean, we would love to replace uh, the classic streaming systems like Apple Music, Spotify, have them like, completely decentralized into different systems. That's the big vision. Then if we're going to do all of it, just a small part of it, at least we got, we got the process going. Yeah, uh, yeah our, our vision is to unleash, let's say, the collaborative superpowers of humans uh, where uh, in digital societies there are no limitations to that. So you can literally collaborate and create and build with anyone in the world, whether you are 12 year old or 88 year old, uh, regardless of your background. As long as you want to achieve something, you will have the network and the funding and every capability you need to achieve what you want to achieve without any limits. Because Web3 brings all of that potential together uh, in a frictionless way. Great. Are you Question. sold? <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? <laughs> no question. So everything was clear. I see one hand over there. So oh, there's one, hand uh, there's there. one in the back. I'm Neil Osborne, um, a SkyTile investor. Uh, what you speak of is most interesting and enlightening. But the people out there know nothing of Web3. They just know that tokens are dangerous and often hacked and stolen. So what can we do as a group to explain Web3 in ways that the people that you want to draw into your products can understand and grasp thank you it's a great question um i think that there has been a lot of talk for a while that there's a big ux problem with with crypto and blockchain and there is and there are lots of people working on trying to make that better we, I mean, we're one of them with nfts and uh wallet structure and things like that will hopefully make things a little easier um i think the i think there's a a, a mismatch in generally what you know, I call legacy media represents tokens as, seems to only focus on this hack or that hack or this scam and that scam. And because of the nature of the technology, of course, there's tons of scams and there's lots of snake oil, um, just like there was in the, you know, the old dot-com bubbles in many ways. But at the heart of it is a completely new paradigm shifting technology. Um, and some of the most valuable things uh, uh, that, 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 that can be offered will come out of this base technology. Um, so I think when it comes to educating new users into the space, you can do it through creating the best UX that you possibly can with what's available right now to ease their way into it. And then work, focus on trying to educate and trying to take complex things and put them more into lay, lay, lay people terms. And then also counteracting the narratives and arguments that say that most people uh, 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 read. You know, I mean, if you've read the Financial Times on, on crypto or NFTs over the last, I don't even know, two years, you'll find maybe one or two things that talk about it in a positive light and the rest that basically just say it's the worst thing that's ever been invented. Um, and uh, I think that is obviously very wrong and there's a lot of narrative. I, I, we should be stronger with our counter narrative to say that actually the security of the blockchain is second to none. Um, the tokens aren't actually hacked in as far as the protocol, the underlying protocol itself is, 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 is compromised. It is businesses, or let's say, you know, companies or, 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 or snake oil salesmen that aren't building properly and with proper security on top of those layers that people then immediately trust and put their value into uh, uh, the, the, that are getting hacked. And that is also, I think, just the nature of uh, an early, you know, uh, immature uh, 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 industry. But it's, it's definitely changing and people are, building you know for the for, for the long haul in this industry and i think that it's going to change over time yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with um we have as a as a crew as you mentioned uh we have to educate media because often they mm. don't make the effort to really try to understand what this is about you know we, this is not about cryptocurrencies this is about building the web 3 mm. the decentralized world of tomorrow it's a new digital revolution is going to be as big as the last one. So it's a tech play. 
Uh, most journalists still don't get that. We have to educate um, regulators, politicians, uh, but it, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's typical innovation uh, sort of path, right? Yeah, we're, I think we're also entering a new, f a new phase because in the past years, a lot of focus went in, uh, into, the in the into the infrastructure. Right, and now, now you see all these teams building on top of that yeah. to actually produce uh, applications and experience that, that matter to people's lives, that have a real world impact. And, and, and that's where you start to see the benefits uh, rather than just the, the, the hype and the, the Wild West uh, stories. So it's really about producing the, the narratives and the stories where you experience the actual benefit of Web3 and crypto and, and such, yeah. apart from uh, the financial benefit, of course. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question over there. Sorry for that. On which precise te technology would you train them? Uh, and how, how much time do you think they would need uh, to be trained in order to be efficient to work on the uh, uh, metaverse globally speaking, or the Web3, globally speaking? And do they need to be engineers before, or not? I don't think they need to be engineers. I think if you look at the Polkadot Ambassadors program, for example, there's a huge community building effort where a lot of education goes on with tens of thousands of people globally. And uh, more and more people are coming into the space. Um, so I, I, I think uh, people are, are, that are intrinsically motivated to, to bring the space forward, uh, they learn very quickly. Uh, setting up your wallet is easier than getting a bank account. So uh, it w it's, it's also easier than um, in setting up your internet connection in 1998 when you were still had to do TCP IP settings and su such a, su stuff like that. Getting crypto in, in the wallet is a maybe a little bit more difficult, huh? but um, I, I, I would say uh, yeah, the, the, the education programs that, that are in place show that there's, there's already uh, growth uh, going on. And I, and I see that um, yeah, exponentially scaling, actually. Because yeah. there's a huge community of, of, of people that are really happy about educating so others. So there is no talent shortage? Well, there is talent shortage in, this, in the sense that um, there is so much demand for, for developers that, that yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge as a, as a founder. But that's, I think, I mean, if you want to build a house today, it's also a challenge to find uh, talent, right, for that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of time, so I would say, as well. Yeah. All right. So let's close the discussion here. We have one more thing. Uh, Rutger, you wanted to show us a quick demo? Yeah, I thought, we, 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 I thought it would be nice if we talk about the metaverse. Two, two three minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, also show, show a little bit um, um, under the hood, so to say. <coughs> and... And maybe we can kill the lights here uh, a little bit. Um, <coughs> so this is in development. We're launching this on May 24th. It's the Kusamaverse, and we're building, uh, with the support of the Kusama Treasury, um, a home for the uh, Kusama ecosystem. Um, so yes, it's Web3. So we log in with uh, our, uh, our wallet. Um, to uh, record this for the video later. So <coughs> we have integrated a gaming engine into this uh, stack. So it takes a little while longer than loading a, an average uh, website. And uh, um, I will first zoom out and uh, show you what we are uh, building in several phases. So if people ask you, have you ever seen a blockchain? Now you can say yes. Because uh, what we see here is the relay chain. And these things are actual blocks being processed as we speak in real time. They're being validated by these uh, little guys. It's uh, validator nodes. In uh, Kusama, there's uh, a thousand in the active set. 
and people nominate these nodes with their stake. So you stake in these nodes, then they get nominated to validate the blocks, and uh, this is how the network is uh, secured. Uh, um, and you get can earn staking rewards. So what what we um, enabled uh, these uh, these operators to do is um, build their own space, and uh, instead of selecting your uh, validator node in which you want to stake from a list, you now can do business with, for example, paranodes. Right? So you can enter his space and do uh, actual staking f uh, straight from the, from the metaverse. Uh, so, so you can basically say, oh, I like you as a guy, and uh, 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 yeah, I want to stake my tokens in your, uh, in your, in your validator, and you, you, make a, you make a proper return on that. The, this this uh, this is a, a small company. Uh, they can organize uh, events, for example, uh, a biweekly community call, for example. Uh, they can host a stage. It's basically clubhouse with video, so you have a couple of people on stage and thousands of people can listen in. They can share the, their screen. There is a Miro whiteboard. There's Google Docs integrations. So there you can see you have the composability of Web2 if you want to bring it in. Uh, so you can work with a couple of uh, people on this document that are flying in this space and, and entering here. You also see my, my video uh, uh, over there. Um, but, but you also can, can engage in all kinds of on-chain uh, activities. And then there is uh, community spaces here where the Kusama community, there are all kinds of groups working together. Right? So um, um, here, for example, we have the Substrate Builders Program. Um, where they will host gatherings. Here we have the Thousand Validators program that supports the centralization of the of the network that hosts events. Um, so there's 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 all kinds of uh, gatherings that can take place, and you see all the parachains that have a place as well. And so, for example, uh, you see here Kilt. Uh, they're working on uh, self-sovereign identity, and um, now this is this is a mere uh, meeting space, but Look at this space as a portal to the to the world that Kilt uh, will build, where uh, their utility comes to life and vice versa. The utility will be integrated into the world builder. And so, yeah, this is this is uh, again this is still in 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 development. It's very early stage. What also will be entered in the, in the in the next stages is the the parachain, uh, the crowdfunding. Uh, sorry, the crowd loans. And so you can literally see the crowd loans taking place real time in the metaverse, and um, yeah, that, uh, bringing in the governance. Uh, so Polk Assembly, for example, so you can see how uh, people are voting on proposals. P uh, people can work on actual proposals uh, from from this uh, space, and, and this is kind of the I, w I see this if if the Dotsama ecosystem is a, is a global digital society, this is kind of a, its its democratic heart, so to say, where you can see the inner workings. And yeah, there's loads of, of, of stuff you can bring in here um, that, uh, that you can do. Uh, also, you see that there's people here. So Genevieve, for example, is flying around here somewhere. Uh, I, I can see her here as another uh, being of light. I can high five her. Uh, we can, we can uh, grab a table. I'm, I'm not sure if they enabled that. But, but you can instantly connect with each other. Um, um, so if she would accept my, my <laughs> invitation, then she, she would appear there as well, and we're, we're having a conversation. So there's lots of serendipity. We actually used this, uh, the same engine with our hackathon, and there were, imagine, thousands of people flying around and, and, and collaborating. It's really uh, like, a, like a, a hive, you know? And uh, then imagine thousands of these worlds where you can hop from one world to another, uh, really like uh, with, a, uh, with a multilateral connection amongst each other. So, yeah, great.